One of the things I can't stand about work, okay, any circumstance, is conflict. I've had jobs where my, where my role was to mediate conflict in education and things like that. And the way that it works in any institution, among any group of friends, in the church, schools, is that everything is perfect when everybody agrees. But when there's disagreement, immediately, you have noticed, you've found this, all bits are off. All of a sudden, things you counted on friendships often are challenged or stretched. Uh, they become bitter, bitter, brittle, can break. And it's all based on this idea of conflict. And we try to, at times to avoid it, ignore it. In moments of weakness, we're tempted to give in to it and capitulate on what we believe is the right thing, even when we know it's the right thing. And sometimes we just have to face it, don't we? With a good sense of a good headstrong knowledge of what we need to do regardless of the circumstance or the outcome. We have to make the right choice because that's what we're called to. And you think, well, what about the church? Shouldn't that be the one place where we don't have this conflict? And of course the answer is yes. Jesus said that they may be one. And in Philippians, if you read the first chapter, in the first two chapters, this whole understanding about being of one mind. And yes, that's the goal. But it's interesting that Jesus himself says, don't expect there not to be conflict if you're going to follow me. Don't be surprised if you run into conflict when all you're trying to do is follow the Lord. In fact, listen to what he says in our gospel today. I have come to set the earth on fire. Wow. And how I wish you were already blazing. I've come to set the earth on fire. Then he continues, do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And we hear words like that and we're saying, wait a minute, Jesus. When you were born at your nativity, the angel said, peace on earth will toward men. Right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Or rather, the angel said? Not exactly. What they actually said was this. Peace on earth and goodwill to all on whom God's favor rests. On those on whom God's favor rests. Who are those people but those who are following God? Those who respond to Jesus, not to the entire world. In other words, the peace God is promising there is not peace on earth, but rather peace in our hearts and our peace that when we gather in his name that we work towards that union of thought and mind and so forth. That's a little different. And Jesus himself is well acquainted with this understanding of there being conflict. Look in your Bibles to page 1070. And if you go down to the second column, all the way to the bottom, chapter 7, look at verse 2. Think, well, how does Jesus know all this, besides being the Son of God? Look at verse 2. They're getting ready to go to a, a, a Feast of Tabernacles, a big Jewish festival in Jerusalem. Jesus and his family, his uh, his mother Mary, Joseph probably died by now, but his stepbrothers or cousins sisters or cousins again. Listen to what it says. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world." For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Isn't that amazing? The Son of God living in your house, he was just too familiar, and there was conflict even in the family of Jesus Christ. So when you 
have an epiphany in your faith. Something happens in your life and you find yourself drawing, drawing closer to God because you say, oh, this is real. I need to get closer to Jesus. And all of a sudden, your loved ones or the people around you or your friends do not understand and feel threatened by the fact that you're becoming too religious. Why should you be, why should you be surprised that there's conflict? Because then they feel threatened. All of a sudden, the things that they knew about you and about themselves has changed. And thus we have conflict, stress, difficulty, hardships. And you might ask yourself, well, why is it? Why does Christianity cause such conflict if it's all about love and peace and truth, loving your neighbor, loving your enemy, praying for those who despitefully use you, trying to do the right thing. Why is there conflict there? Partly because it's human nature. The other thing is this. There is an exclusivism to Christianity. It's exclusive. Jesus said this. I am the way, the truth, <laughs> And the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Paul said of Jesus, His is the only name under heaven by which we must be saved. So when we say exclusive words like that, it offends people who choose not to follow that. And so consequently, Jesus sets us up for conflict. I think sometimes we Christians are too naive. I read recently about two evangelical Christians, Protestants, leaders in, in evangelicalism, and they both left the faith. They both apostatized, is what it's called. They left the faith, and their explanations for that, their accusations against Christianity were, flat, were silly, they were flaccid, they were brittle, they were thin, they were ridiculous ideas of the accusations they had against the church for their leaving. And you think, well, why did they do that? I think they got tired of the conflict. They got tired of having to defend themselves and just being left alone, and so instead they decided just to give in rather than avoiding it, rather than ignoring it, they choose to capitulate to it. It's the easiest way. Do you remember the parable of the sower and the seeds? A sower went out to sow, and he spreads his seeds. Some fell on the road, some fell on, this, on the rocky soil, some fell among weeds, and some among good soil. That's a parable Jesus told him. What it means is that God sees, sows his word. And depending on the type of soil it lands, it determines whether or not it's going to bear fruit. And when it says it falls on the rocky soil, what it means there is there's not enough depth there for the roots to take, to take hold and for it to survive, and so it dies. That's conflict. If we don't persevere under conflict, if we just give in or try and avoid or run away from it or whatever, what happens is that we have no roots in which to base our faith. So Jesus says, persevere. Stand up to this because it will come. Do not be surprised. And so we might ask ourselves, how do we do this? What are we supposed to do instead? This is the fascinating part. If Jesus' words set the world aflame, you know what your job is? Fan the flames. Fan the flames. Because until the whole world is on fire with the Word of God, until that fire is burning within you, until you're almost consumed by the Word of God and by the presence of Christ, there will be no change. If Jesus truly is the answer, then we fan the flames. We don't tell people what they don't want to hear to the point where they just tune us out. If somebody doesn't want to listen, we don't force ourselves on them. But at the same time, we don't change who we are. 
We identify with Christ. We gather in the name of Jesus, and so we can be nothing but flames of fire as God's Spirit is in us. And here's the amazing thing. If we choose not to avoid conflict, if we choose not to ignore it, if we choose not to capitulate, but instead say, no, this is who I am. I love you for who you are. The flames are flames of love, not judgment. The flames of mercy, the flames of compassion. I choose to fan those flames. You know what happens? They come around. Jesus' brothers, those cousins or stepbrothers or whatever they were, two of them were James and Jude. After Jesus rose from the dead, those flames of love converted James and he became the bishop of Jerusalem. And after Jesus rose from the dead, I think it's the Gospel of Luke, it says Jesus went and talked to him. At the end of the New Testament is a small book called Jude. It's by another brother of Jesus who has wonderful things to say about faith and about his Jewish roots as well. If you fan the flames, if you live your life, all those people who have trouble with you, all those people who are conflicted, they will come around. But there will be division. Have no doubt of it. And as a priest, I often get that just by virtue of who I am. In fact, here's what I do. I keep a collar, you know one of those tabs, white tabs, priests wear? I keep a collar on the glove box of my car because I figure if I ever get pulled over, <laughs> just having that, if I put it on, I have a 50-50 chance of getting out of the ticket. <laughs> because there's a third of them are probably Catholic, that'll, the police that'll pull me over. Some of them will be Protestant, but of course, I run the other hat risk of getting my car impounded if somebody is, has a conflict with Christianity. You will be conflicted if you're doing your job. If you are following Christ, you will inherit conflict, but will you face it for the name of, in the name of Christ? Will you let God use your conflict for the benefit of the person who is conflicted? We're not conflicted to them. Whoever is opposing us, they're conflicted with themselves. Let Jesus work on them.